uh, an FS Club webinar. I'm absolutely delighted today to be welcoming Chandu Chalakapati, who is dialing in from the United States, from Alvarez and Marsal. And he's going to be talking today about uh, uncovering opportunities, you know, how, how finance executives, or in fact, anyone in finance, uh, can use machine learning to gain a leading edge. Now, you know me, probably, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the uh, directors of Zien. And it really is a privilege for me to be able to introduce uh, so many of these fascinating webinars that we're holding. Uh, and that's not least because our sponsors across the world allow us to range widely and freely in technology, economics, and finance. And today, of course, combines all of that. We're going to be looking at some of the advanced uh, technology out there. A lot of people like to call it artificial intelligence or AI. I certainly don't. Uh, to me, it's just at the end of the day, machines recognizing patterns and trying to figure out ways to repeat them successfully. Uh, and I think Chandu is very much of, of my school. So nitty gritty, get down to it uh, type of program. Um, uh, you'll notice amongst our many sponsors, several of them are, or many of them are, are very involved in technology in general, but are also in this space. And what Chandu is going to talk about today is exciting because he's there, but that's great. Uh, but how do you go about finding the opportunities? And he's going to be basing quite a bit of this on some deep work that he's really done on a package called Lease Score. So you're not talking to a generalist or somebody who's been looking at this uh, from consultancy and knows machine learning from PowerPoint. You're looking at somebody who's been there and done it. Uh, and Chandu has a very, very rich uh, background. And you can, can get all of this, as you know, on the slides uh, and on the website. Now, just before I hand over to Chandu, and it is my job to get out of the way and let you let you listen to him. Uh, please remember that we're going to have a discussion session of about 20 minutes at the end. And so do use the GoToWebinar facility to submit questions, which I'll feed into the discussion uh, with Chandu. And the reason for that is uh, if you don't use the GoToWebinar facility and email me, I won't see them. I'm here with you online. And so it's important uh, to, to, to use that facility to get to get the discussion going. And I would encourage you to get your questions in early, even if they're half formed, uh, again, because we tend to get a lot of questions at the end and uh, we will, won't have time to answer all of them. Uh, we probably won't have time to answer all of them and any questions or comments that uh, run over, I will be feeding to Chandu. And as I said, the slides, the question that always seems to come up with these things is, are the slides going to be posted? The slides already are posted, so you can go and uh, look at them. But uh, with no more ado, uh, Chandu, the floor is uh, very, very much yours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, ZN Group, for having me. And uh, thank you all for joining. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to get right into it. I want to talk through how machine learning can really give the finance function uh, an edge. And today, we're going to first tar start with what is machine learning? And then how do you use it? So what are good problems that, that uh, machine learning could solve? How do you prepare the data? How deeply do you need to understand the algorithms? And then ultimately, how do you test, know, and improve those outputs so that you have a trained model that you can use? I'm going to give you part of uh, my journey through ML to, to help talk you through the pitfalls and things that, I, that, that we uh, have gone through. And through that, the case study at the end will be about least score, like Michael mentioned. So what is machine learning? And this is my definition. It's uh, pretty in line with what Michael kind of set out at the beginning. I, I think machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and it, it isn't truly artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about supervised versus unsupervised where, where there's, a, there's some overlap, but it's really focused on training computers to use algorithms to make predictions or classifications using provided data. And the key things here are algorithms and data and then you're making either a prediction or a classification. So algorithms, data, all these things sound somewhat complicated, but once you have an understanding of these algorithms, you get a trained model, this really is no different than any of your other statistics that you are accustomed to. Average, median, mean, frequency, probability, all of these things are, are kind of daily use. And soon machine learning, I think, is gonna be that way as well. Next slide. So speaking of that, how will ML machine learning impact the finance function? And one thing that you'll, you'll, is very important is we think that many of the key inputs that go into FP&A or deal models or any of the kind of finance modeling that you, that's being done 
will soon be informed by ML models. If you're looking for trying to understand the receivables of a company, that's something that maybe ML would predict better than what is the average time to to pay to to payment, uh, things like that. So, and those types of input puts, if they're going to be informed by ML models, we need analysts to analyze that data and support those inputs. So it's as far as the outputs, the industry knowledge of your analysts will become highly valued. And we believe that all of this is going to lead to a quicker turnaround on high functioning models. And then of course, using ML, you, you should be able to provide more accuracy in that delivery. Um, and most importantly, the question we get most when I when I have these uh, these types of talks is, what about people? Is that Terminator over there going to uh, replace all humans with this machine learning stuff? And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I will say that analysts will have to identify when the ML model misses, and understanding the problem and the solution are key. And I think there's one more animation here. We had thought I'd removed all of them, but that guy is gonna be the, the helper, not the Terminator. And really the machine learning models are truly just something that is going to be another statistic that helps you deliver uh, good outcomes for, for finance. Next slide. All right, so how do we pick a good project? How do we know that machine learning will uh, will be a, a good use for solving a problem. First, I wanna talk about two things, supervised versus unsupervised. Everything we're gonna be talking about today is supervised models. Unsupervised models are where the data is continuous and, and, and uh, not delivered by anyone. It's, it's kind of where the machine is not asked to solve any specific problem or find any specific type of relationship. It's simply going to look, comb through data and comb through data and finally find something. That That's something that um, may be uh, a long way away, but, but really not something that we typically see in the finance function. So we're gonna be talking about supervised models. Um, if the model is gonna be simple, if it's something that is like A plus B equals C and we know it very well, this is usually not a great, uh, problem for machine learning because we already have a lot of statistics and a lot of ways to dice that that, that are already probably um, giving you the results you need. So we're really looking for complex problems, things that have a lot of different features, a lot of data, and, and they're rich in, 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 in the data. And so you see what we, you know, the example is A plus B plus how many ever things and function of equals Z. This, if you look at that, it's very similar to kind of a regression type um, formula. And this is something that I think is, is usually a very good, um, a very good way to, to, to consider a problem. If in fact, you're already using regression, multivariate regression for a problem, it probably lends itself pretty well to machine learning as well. The key to any machine learning project though, is the data. You have to have a solid foundation of data and and very important to this is, remember we're doing a supervised model. And so you need to have data that also has the outcome. So you need to be able to train the model on data that has an outcome so that it knows to train to a right answer. Um, and then you need to have access to that data. Of course, you, that becomes expensive if you don't actually have the data yourself or, or difficult. And then ultimately, like we've, we've said a few times, and I'll, I'll keep harping on this, is that your, you, your analysts and expertise are gonna be important to being able to make uh, the machine learning project work. You need to be able to understand when the results are right. Next slide. So I wanna talk through just as an example, because you're gonna see some in some of these slides, my actual results as I was going through our first ML project. And it was really for debt valuation. Now I run a valuation business. We value debt, equity, and businesses in general. And a very important criteria for all of these is uh, understanding the credit rating of a company, the credit worthiness of a company. So when what we noticed with our debt valuation process was that the current methods that we all use uh, throughout the industry were seem extremely biased 
and, and focused on what the analyst views as important. Um, and regression using five or six characteristics is, is con kind of the standard approach. And, and it doesn't test very well when you look at it um, against historical um, results. And we know that um, in this project, public company data with credit ratings is very is publicly available. So we have a lot of good, rich data. And then we also understand that these credit rating agencies have uh, have have proven to be very late in the to the game to really assess and change their credit rating. Um, so there, it seemed ripe for someone to come in and say, "Is there a better way?" And we, doing a lot of debt valuations. Um, are kind of experts in the field, so we have the the, the capacity to understand if our model, model's right or wrong. So we set out to um, set out to uh, to try and get predict what the S and P would rate uh, private companies using a machine learning model. So that that's going to be the backdrop of of uh, a lot of what we talk about here. So first and foremost, like we said, um, once you know that the project is suitable, then you need to go and find and gather your data. Selecting and preparing the data is key. So first, the models are gonna be trained and tested on data. So the question is how much data is needed? And what we've done is we put together a, uh, a, a randomized function that had seven different uh, functions built in. And we randomly selected, we killed, built a data set that was randomly selected through seven functions and, and uh, random numbers to create a data set. And then we tested our machine learning models on that data to see when it would start to predict um, and, and predict accurately. And you'll see that within a thousand or so um, random observations, some machine learning models were already becoming 90% predictive. Um, so the key here is that you don't need big data. You, you you do need data, but but it can start to work on a fairly small number of observations. Next slide. So first, you got to you must separate the data into a training and test set. Um, we're we're going to train the model on our training data, and then we have to have something to test to make sure that that model is uh, is is actually going to predict or classify correctly. So. Couple few, a few things to think about is when you are preparing your data, you want to avoid cross-contamination between the train and test data. If you're trying to, for example, if you're trying to predict um, where you're going to open up your next uh, retail store, for example, um, and you're training a model to predict based on all of these different factors, location, all these different things, and you're training a model on your own historical performance of, of various stores, you don't want to have the same store in both the train and test, because oftentimes the model will be able to just pick out what is that store, and it's going to predict that that store will be that same store will be successful in the test data, instead of looking at location and and revenue and AR and all these different things. So you have to be careful about cross contaminating between train and test data. Uh, another key factor: machine learning models don't handle text, um, and so you have to convert that to numeric data. And it has to be meaningful. And um, in in our sample credit rating estimator that we call SCORE, one key area is industry. Now, industry is has numbers associated with it, but let's say you have 30 industries and you just turn them into one through 30. Well, the machine doesn't know that there's no relationship between one and two. Meanwhile, those could be two very different industries. So you have to convert the the text into numeric data, and then you have to also figure out ways to make sure that the model doesn't create some sort of bias towards uh, that data. And we use one hot encoding as one as an example of how to do that. Um, and then you have to consider whether there's implicit or explicit bias in the data. Um, and and this is really where um, in, an example of that would be if you're if you're looking at a loan portfolio or something of small loans, small business loans, and and uh, you have an, an analyst that's rating these these loans based on uh, some some methodology that has um, has kind of a human element to it. Well, that score, if included in the data set, now has implied bias of of the outcome. 
Um, and then explicit bias is, of course, uh, is, is more simply, you know, if you tell tell the, uh, if in the data there's actually something that says what the result is going to be, um, that, of course, will, will bias the data as well. Next slide. I want to talk through some of the algorithms. I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time trying to explain the algorithms. We can spend, um, you know, there's there's whole college degrees for this, but um, but what I do want to point out is k-nearest neighbors, regression, support vector machine, uh, decision trees, neural networks. These are all things that you're going to hear about if you start looking into uh, machine learning. And I I put in a chart with uh, from NumSense, data science for the layman no math added. I don't actually agree with all of these check marks here, but um, what I wanted to point out is that it's not one size fits all. And certain of these algorithms are going to be better for certain types of, of uh, whether it's classification or prediction. And then something that's very important to, to us was whether the results can be interpretable or not. Um, so um, these are a few of the algorithms. We're going to show you a few more. One thing I will point out is that in finance, we don't see a lot of use of neural networks, um, but all of these other methods are, are fairly common within finance. Next slide. And if you want the algorithm overload, here it is for you. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll just skip right through this. Go to the next slide. So. You don't have to be a data scientist to assess whether an algorithm is going to be a good solution for the problem or not. You need to have a basic understanding of what the algorithm is trying to do. But some of the questions you need to ask yourself is, is, a class, is it a classification or prediction problem? For the sample credit rating estimator, we have um, a, a classification problem here. And that is similar to where machine learning kind of started. Um, if, you know, uh, the classic, is it a dog or a cat, is a classification. And the same thing with credit ratings. We're trying to determine whether it's AAA or C, and, and which of those classifications does a company, a private company, belong in. Um, does the outcome require a discrete number, or is it a continuous number? Um, so that, that's an important question to understand. And then are you looking for outliers versus trying to predict something that is um, that that is, you know, um, a gradient throughout um, the data set. So those are some of the key things that you you want to you want to look at for algorithm. Next slide. All right. So, do you is machine learning a black box? How do you know what's right? This is one of my favorite um, one of one of my favorite uh, uh, cartoons here. To describe this, you see two people. That's one of the key things I like to point out in this is people are always necessary when it comes to machine learning. So he says, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pair the, pour the data in here and into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Well, just stir the pile until they start looking right. So that's very important because this is exactly what we keep, what I keep talking about is that we need expertise. We need analysts to understand if there's causality in these in the answers and the outcomes that we get, um, so how do we how do how do we start assessing whether these outcomes are right? Next slide. So, what do train and test results mean? Um, you want train and test results that that are aligned, and this is an actual output that you see here from our first run when we started to we we used 20 years of data, and every single quarterly Com public company uh, financial statement. We took 450 features from every single financial statement and and um, ran it through all of these various um, machine learning models. So what we saw here is that um, you can see there that first of all, what we noticed is that linear regression, logistic regression um, was testing more poorly than our own linear regression models. Um, what we saw is that decision trees were training really well, but not testing as highly as they train. Now they still test well, but not as highly as they train. That is a good sign that you're out, your model is overfitting the data and that your data is not, uh, there, there might be something about your data that, that isn't perfect. Obviously high test scores are best. 
And um, over to the right, you can also see that we tested to see how long it was taking us to process this information. Um, next slide. So we then had to go through and determine which models that we were going to select to continue to test. And we wanted to start to look at our, our data itself. And then, so we, we, we started to look at this and we said we were going back 20 years. And what we realized is that, is that our regression models never went back that far. And then we, we thought, oh, well, you know what? We're trying to predict s and at what S&P would rate a company. And there was a small event that happened in 2008 that changed the way that S&P looked at, at um, how their ratings were. So we then reduced our data set to, um, to only use the last uh, 2009 and forward. And all of a sudden, we were getting um, significantly better results. And you can see in our linear regression models down in the middle of that score results, at 70 and 70%, that's very in line with what we were seeing uh, in our historical uh, approach. So we, we continue to um, train and tune and test. And, um, and then you see that we are getting uh, very high scores with decision trees and random forest. Now, a, a random forest is truly just a, a large number of decision trees. So we expect that it's going to perform very similar decision trees and, and probably slightly better. Um, next slide. So once we decided that we were gonna use a decision tree or, or random forest, we then said, wait a second, do we still want 450 features to come up with uh, the actual test result and, and, and in our model? That would require for every private company that we might use this model on, to also have 450 features, which we would never get. So we use principal component analysis to kind of reduce the features um, and, and test the relevance of the features to reduce them to a point where the model could be agile and accurate. And then once we got to that point, which is truly 16 features, uh, less than 20, as you can see, um, we then tuned the model to optimize it uh, going forward. Next slide. And finally, once you have a model, you need to be able to test and investigate the results. And visualization software might, is helpful in this. And one of the key things that, that you wanna work, be careful of is you might be highly accurate, but what if your misses are very large for what you're trying to, to uh, achieve? And uh, here you can see in our model, we're, we're trying to have misses under two notches. And so you know, in this, in this result, uh, you can see that we we our model was very good in this case of predicting within two 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 notches, and um, and then the other thing you can do is you can actually use machine learning algorithms to test your results as well. So um, really, that that's the entire process to get to a trained model. So next slide. So we then said, okay, this is we a couple of years ago we created score, and then we said, well, um, what do we, what, how can, how are all the different ways that we can use SCORE? And uh, a couple years ago, the accounting standards, both uh, US GAAP and IFRS, required companies to put the present value of operating leases on balance sheet, discount future payments, obligations, discounted at an incremental borrowing rate. So you, in order to get an incremental borrowing rate, the key factor is to get a credit rate. So what we did is, we, we said, okay, well, we, we've created SCORE. Now let's see if we, can, um, if we can use SCORE and combine that with market data to um, quickly and efficiently have companies um, put in current financials and, and be able to get their incremental borrowing rate curve. And so we started to test our model against um, some, of the, some of the alternatives. Uh, Moody's, which is in the credit rating business, um, has a shadow credit rating model, it requires five years of historical financials, and is uh, about 89% accurate of predicting credit ratings within two, two notches. And um, as you can see from our prior slides, SCORE was predicting with a 93 to 94% accuracy using only 16 features in current financials. So we thought here we've got 
um, a machine learning model that has figured out um, the features, the right features, and and has the ability to to test higher than some of our competitors. So we then started to create the documentation and support for the model to convince all the stakeholders that this is in fact um, a, a better approach. And once we did all that, then you can go grab a pint because your problem is solved. Next slide. And uh, here are some resources. Um, I think these are also included in the uh, invitation. And, um, and that's really how we used machine learning and, and a way that you can kind of go from finding a project all the way to, um, to creating a, a model that's, that's uh, functional. And I'm going to take a breath. Very good, Chandu. That was excellent. Um, and in fact, I know it's excellent because we've got lots of questions and I don't mean questions that I don't quite understand, but there were just a few terminology ones. Um, Bob McDowell is dialing in from the Channel Islands, just wanted to understand supervised versus unsupervised. Uh, do unsupervised models evolve into supervised models or vice versa? And if so, over what period? Yeah, as far as supervised versus unsupervised, you know, to be, my my view on it is unsupervised models are trying to find relationships in where in in mass quantities of data that um, are continually evolving. That data is going to be continually evolving. Our view is if you're going to be using unsupervised models, you'll probably continue to to have them operating as the data continues to evolve. But as you find you, as you find some key relationships, you might then you will then switch into a supervised model and try and create something that's actually um, kind of usable. We call it pickled. We pickle the models. We get it so that it is uh, it's actually uh, uh, usable. And but yet the unsupervised mod training will still continue. And do you prefer salty brine or are you more sugar <laughs> pickler? <laughs> I'm a salty brine guy. There we are. <laughs> yeah, uh, just just on on that. In fact, you, you had a really good example there where you pointed out this effectively this disjunction here in 2008, where uh, and and that I think exemplified two things that you know a supervised model hits a wall where there's such an environmental change that the data set that you've played with needs to be revamped. I think that that's 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 a good point, but it also I think underscored a point you made very early on about the uh, the fact that these are not necessarily big data issues. The, the size of the, uh, the data set that you require to get going may or may not be particularly large. It's about moving it. Uh, and it's certainly something in our experience we found uh, very small data sets do have predictive capacity and one should examine machine learning's potential early on, uh, accepting that, well, maybe the data set is too small. Um, so so that, 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 that's extremely good. Um, now you, you've done a lease score. Uh, Liz Russell had a question, well, two questions, actually. Let me kick off with the first one. You uh, directly contrasted yourself with the other credit, with, well, with credit rating agencies, S&P and Moody's. What do they think of these models? Have you had discussions with them? Well, we, we have not had direct discussions with them. Um, I, I believe that they are also trying to train models as well. Um, they, they, of course, have a monopoly on, on the whole rating game. So we're not trying to replace any credit rating agencies. We're actually trying to understand what their predictions are. So we continually retrain our models because their training, their their results may change, and we're simply trying to trying to predict what they would do. Now, without knowing exactly what they would do, despite what they put on their website, we're just seeing if the the machine can learn what they're what they're focused on, um, and and COVID. This this COVID nineteen downturn in the economy could could be another uh, junction point where we have to see if we need to change our data set if we start to be less predictive. Um, but you know, as far as um, the credit rating agencies, they're they're very people intensive and they're 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 selling a product that is uh, meant for companies to contact there for them to contact companies and and prepare uh, a rating. So. Uh, a very different approach, and yeah. we're we're trying to predict what they're doing, not not say we oh. know the creditworthiness of a company. Yeah, uh, I've got three folks here: Donald McRae, Liz Russell, and Bob McDowell, who are all 
variants of the timing issue. Um, so Donald would like to know how long is the shelf life of an MML of a machine learning model, but hold on for a second because uh, Liz then moves into something which is really quite relevant today with airlines, hotels, hospitality, uh, whatever. Financials are a year old, so a company's prediction could be invalidated by major market movements, volatility. And Bob McDowell is also curious about data can and does become stale over time for a variety of external factors events. We spoke about 2008, but is it human ju judgment that's required to determine this or are there automated movements? So just repeat those, you know, what's the shelf life? Um, what about major market movements and any thoughts on how do you know when you need to change? Yeah, it, it's it's really hard, and that's a, these are great questions, and we 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 are when we say we struggle with this, we we think about this um, all the time, and and right now our process is to to reevaluate every quarter for two reasons. One, um, the the there are new quarterly financials available every quarter, so we're gonna we're gonna get new data to to train on. Um, but two, we also test the length of time that we want to use um, going backwards because. All of a sudden, just like we're seeing right now, there could be a, a fundamental shift in the in the markets. There could be macro changes that makes makes the data more stale um, the further you go back. Now, it, is there's no there's no right answer to what is the the shelf life or or any of those the you know there's no simple answer to that. But uh, this is where I continue to go back to. There's humans are necessary. We need experts in these fields. We need to be able to assess whether there is causality here. If we start to see changes in our results or um, is is there something that we can point to that says that actually makes sense? When we first did, um, when we st first did our feature reduction in score, um, one of the most important features that for credit ratings was the size of equity. Now that's absolutely the opposite of what any historical um, outcome, any historical process considered. Nobody thought about equity as, as important to um, what a credit, the credit worthiness of a company, but in fact, it gives you information about what's going on in the market and the size of the company, which then says they're more likely to survive. But not obvious, but for someone that is in the business, all of a sudden, you you might find something in that feature, in those features that says, oh, this is actually more predictive and we never thought about that. So maybe we change the data set or we change um, how we look at it because of that that understanding. Yeah, the, the purpose of the models is to sharpen the questions in many ways, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, Matthew Leach is impressed and you very kindly showed us two slides where you were looking at a whole variety of techniques. Um, He's, I, I think he'd like a, a pretty clear response. How did you manage to run analyses with so many algorithms? What software uh, did you use and how did you get all those variables compatible with all the algorithms that you use? Right, that, that's just a great point. So first of all, we, we spent about 800 total dollars in software costs um, to, to do all of this because we use all open source software. So we use scikit-learn. Um, so accessible through Python, um, and that, and we 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 do this all through um, AWS. So the eight hundred dollars is really server time costs. Um, but but the um, the the way that we went about it is you first have to spend a lot of time with the data to get the data in a usable form. Once you have the data set in a usable form, then you're just allowing um, the the the, the number of servers necessary to run these kind of in parallel. So we just had scikit-learn run through every single algorithm. We, we threw the data set at every single one of these algorithms and got a summary of results back. Um, so all through Python and, and um, really the, the, the time spent is getting the servers and the, the, the everything up and running so that it can do this. And we did this all from a command, command line interface. Obviously that's not, a, that's not easy for non-programmers um, but there is a lot of off-the-shelf software that is coming out um, that, that makes us more accessible. Could you just spell scikit-learn for the audience who are listening? Yes, sorry, S-C-I-K-I-T and and then learn. Great. And um, you'll, if you Google it, it'll it'll take you right there. And from my perspective, uh, we're a big R house. Did you use R at all in some of this? 
we we don't we're we're a matlab and octave we use octave yeah. actually um because we we we're all open source there are two great points in what you just said to the audience it's not a money thing it's a brain power and time thing uh, and also and you and i have heard this i think for many people that the algorithms most of the algorithms are 40 50 years old actually believe it or not right. Um, yeah. The big change has been one data. We're recording things we never recorded before. We've got cheap data storage. And then we've also got, in your, in your point about AWS, we've got processing power. And it's really been the processing power and the data that's changed, not particularly the uh, the techniques. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we continue to use that same process in, so, in whatever problems we're solving is we, we kind of use the, uh, let's see what, the the process I showed you is let's see what all of them return. Now we know mm -hmm. certain things are, we we exclude certain algorithms because we know they're they're not going to be good for that data set. But we do still look at a large number of algorithms every time. Yeah, and uh, I guess from what I just saw there, that example was lear using learning. Uh, sorry, it was using decision trees. But what other algorithms have you jumped on that you've sort of said, well, for this application, it was something else. Yeah, so we, we also use the regression, linear regression models through machine learning, through scikit-learn, as opposed to just a standard multivariate model. Um, and part of the reason for that, um, specifically with SCORE even, is that that's something that people understand. That That's something that people feel very comfortable with. So we use, we still use a lot of, um, a, a lot of linear regression. Um, and then, you know, depending on whether you're trying to find outliers, that's when you start to use um, different things like K nearest neighbors or even um, support vector machines, things like that. So if you're trying to look through a company's history of, of payables or receivables and you're trying to understand, you know, when are, are, is a company going to receive this payment or not? All of a sudden you might want to just say, which are these that look don't look like the others? And say these are more likely than not. These are these are gonna look more like dogs than than cats in terms of these payables or these these clients. And so we 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 all when we're looking at outliers specifically or for outliers, we use different uh, models. Now, Lizzie uh, in East London, uh, as you used a term overfitting to explain uh, the data, could you just elaborate on that uh, a bit? Yeah. So. When we say overfit, what we're what we're really talking about is that the data has so much information in it, and that when you try and train it, it always seems like it's going to pick up the the right answer. It's going to pick out the right answer. Um, that's because it it essentially has a few things that are um, telling it that the model is. If you see this, the answer is this, and it it. It looks like it's going to give you the right answer every time, because remember, when you're training, you actually have the outcome. So, in a, for example, when we're training for credit, we put in all these 450 features from asset, net asset, debt, all these different things, but we also tell it the credit rating at the end. Well, at some point, the comp, the the training model might actually pick up on the fact that, hey, this same company, um, and and these same features, if you see size or you see whatever, is going to pick up on that that answer, that that outcome. But then you go into the test data and that outcome isn't there anymore. And now you don't have that, you're not getting that same result because it's not able, it, it's not able to find that because the this that same um, model is fitting really well on the training, but not fitting on the on the test data. And even though you have the same, one yeah. of the one of the funnier examples uh, I picked up once in machine learning on visual data was they were trying to distinguish wolves from dogs, and it was going extremely well. Uh, and then when they tried to use it in real life, it was terrible. And the reason was that it had been trained on all these wolves were on snow, so any picture with snow in it was a wolf, and any picture without right. snow right. was a dog. Uh, so yeah, so very 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 good explanation there. And another one uh, from uh, Ian and uh, and Janie who are out in Manitoba, they'd like to know, uh, you, you, you emphasized uh, the, that it was interpretable. Um, you said that was a characteristic you were lo looking for in the algorithms you use. Uh, could you explain what, what, that, what you meant by that, why that's important? Yeah, so the, the, for, for what I do in my, in my line of business, 
I need to convince whoever is using this that um, the answer is not a black box and you can actually go and, and understand how it came to this result. And so when you think about a decision tree versus a random forest, a decision tree, you can actually say we want 20 branches or 20, uh, 20 levels and how many you can, uh, you can define that. And then ultimately you can get a picture of that. You can say, oh, it went through this exact process to, to classify this company as this credit rating. With a random forest, you cannot do that because it's, it's, it's randomly choosing all of these different decision trees to come up with this problem. So you can no longer see how it came to that conclusion. And that's very, that became very important to us um, because um, many of the people that are auditing or reviewing the, the end product um, can't identify whether the, the model's working correctly or not. They can't reperform it, for example. Um, so that, that's the reason why we chose a decision tree even though the random forest was 2% more predictive. Very good, yeah. So the importance of being able to explain to the people who are paying for it what's going on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, another question uh, came up. You, you mentioned that you don't see neural networks much in, in your area of finance. And, I, um, and I'm conscious, of course, that neural networks are being used in a lot of areas like vision recognition and, and almost sensory interpretation. Um, but could you explain why you don't find them useful in your in your in your sector? Yeah, the neural networks are fantastic, and and they 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 might be useful. Um, they might give us very predictive results. Um, we haven't found when we run we because we we still run through the neural network um, algorithms as well. We just haven't found that they're as predictive with smaller data sets. So. If you, as you have bigger and more uh, granular data sets, um, that they, they become a lot more effective. And um, like you say, for visuals, for example, um, neural networks are able to break down pictures into really a whole host of, of different layers in that same image. And really the data that we're, we're looking at is um, not as fine or complex as that. And so, um, um, I've only got time for three questions, and this one I think is a pretty quick one. So it's from Hugh Purser. He's going back to your point about the uh, fact that you turned up the scale of equity. If equity is so important, it applies to early, earlier stage company data. Uh, so earlier stage companies don't have long PNL or balance sheet histories. This data could be they could be measured successfully on the system. Is that correct? So there there are a couple a couple types of companies that don't do well within our our machine learning model and we we've already we know this it's one of them is early stage companies and the other is really poor credit companies if you're already um, near near distress we our our model doesn't can't differentiate between a c rated company and a a, a much worse company it's okay. to, to our model it it all of that is kind of the outlier group. And so, and the problem with early stage companies is there are very few of them that are public. So the training that we did for our model is, um, doesn't capture the true difficulties and, and, uh, and, and uh, positive um, attributes of, of early stage companies. So, um, and then the other one is financial companies. We, we just took out all financial services companies from that. Um, and then I've got a, a really great question here from Scott Bryan. Uh, how do you audit a machine learning model? You know, uh, yeah. So this is um, this again is where you need to have expertise. If you're trying, if you don't, if you're trying to just throw data that you find on on uh, on on the internet into a machine learning model, it's unlikely you're going to know and be able to figure out whether or not. The machine learner learning model has provided the right result. Um, the way that we went about it is through visualization software. We started to look at our misses, and then that's how we identified, for example, that it's not good at certain companies, certain types of companies. Um, so, uh, from an audit standpoint, um, you know, when we're what we're dealing with with external audit firms that are trying to review this is we are over describing every single part of the process such that you could almost recreate it if you wanted recreate your own machine learning model where 
Um, again, we're we're all open source, so we're not nothing that we're doing is is like super proprietary. We we believe that um, a lot of other people should be able to get to these type of results, um, you know, with the right expertise. Uh, one of the great things about the FS Club community is I, I almost don't need to look at my watch because they're such a polite and kind bunch. They send in congratulations and thank you and well done, Chandu, and all that, which tells me I'm running out of time. But I'm going to squeeze one last question in uh, from Liz Thrussell again. Um, you know, here you are. You've you've given us you know a really wonderful example in a in an aerospace. But looking ahead from A and M's perspective, what are some of the other areas that you hope to use uh, machine learning on? other prediction areas? Well, we're a valuation shop. So we we are looking at um, informing every single one of our inputs into our business valuation model to whether from beta to long-term growth rates to every, choosing co uh, peer companies and competitor companies, um, which we use K-nearest neighbors for that we're, and, and text recognition. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're, we want to value portfolios of small business loans and portfolios of of, um, of companies for private equity. So um, we, we believe that we're going to take, uh, we, we really believe what I said first is that I think all of finance is going in within five years, a lot of inputs, a lot of the key things that we're looking at are going to use machine learning as a starting point. Well, Chandu, that is absolutely superb. If you just hold there for a second, I've got three rounds of thanks. Uh, my first round of thanks is, as ever, to our sponsors. Uh, I hope that they've appreciated something that really brings all the fields that we're interested in together, technology, economics, and finance. Uh, and many of them uh, do offer products and services in this area. I would also like to thank the audience. You've been really great today. Um, I'm delighted to see so many online and, and so many engaged with the conversation. That's uh, very gratifying. and. Uh, I think it's a tribute to Chandu's work. Uh, just a reminder that we've got a few things ahead. We have a really fascinating session on uh, technology cooperation between China and the UK uh, coming up tomorrow. Uh, if you'd like to uh, check it out, uh, please drop a private note to us. It's a kind of a semi-closed session. Uh, we are also uh, having on employee share screen schemes on Wednesday. Uh, and finally, uh, this week on Thursday, Nature Smart Cities, Simon Mills is going to be exploring work that's been done across Northern Europe with eight smart cities, uh, looking at how they can finance uh, green projects and not just the UK view of it, uh, but also uh, across the North Sea. So there's quite a bit coming up and uh, it should be a lot of fun. But uh, Chandu, um, I'm afraid in these days of COVID, I'm unable to thank you appropriately. You'll just have to uh, take the audience questions when I send them to you as a credit to getting everyone engaged and explaining things so succinctly and clearly in a field I happen to be uh, qu quite fond of myself. I'm unable uh, to open up the floodgates and let the applause come in, uh, but I am able to provide it myself. I will be using a predictive clapper here. This is my Korean karmic clapper from a proper Korean temple, Bulgoksa, and I will now thank you appropriately. Uh, but seriously, time to really really good and uh, we hope to perhaps have you back after you've got your next machine learning project it was really fun to listen to thank you very very much thank you